Judy Juanita is an American poet, novelist, playwright, and writing teacher at Laney College. Uh, in 1968, while attending San Francisco State, Judy served as the editor-in-chief of the Black Panther, the newspaper of the Black Panther Party, and worked on their Free Breakfast for Children program. Uh, Judy's writing is archived at Duke University um, and additionally has 11 plays uh, archived at Ohio State University where her full-length play, uh, The Odyssey, I think I pronounced that right, I hope so, won a major prize in the Eileen Heckert Senior Play Competition in 2008. Um, we also have Lisa Perlman, a retired judge, prize-winning historian and documentary film producer. She's among the key country's leading experts on the 1968 Huey Newton death penalty trial. Her books compare the explosive state of the American rape, race relations starting with that trial that launched the Black Panther Party and transformed the American jury system all the way to race relations today. Um, and is currently working with award-winning documentarian Andy Abrams Wilson on a documentary on the Newton trial, American Justice on Trial, People v. Newt. Okay, and with that, we'll go ahead and turn it over to Judy. So I just, um, um, hello to everyone. Um, I wanted to just give a little background. Um, the backdrop uh, at that time, and I was 20, uh, 19 and 20 when I joined, was that, of course, everyone knows the, our, our society was in a great turmoil. Uh, we had the civil rights movement going on. That was directly impacting Black communities, uh, the Vietnam War. And also the assassination of Malcolm X was re really triggering, in, in 1965, was really triggering a lot of um, dedication and uh, commitment to uh, the solution to to ch to cha challenging white supremacy to challenging the government. So at that point, the civil rights movement was working to dismantle the Jim Crow segregation, and it was calling for full citizen citizenship rights for Black people. Well, the Black Panther Party rejected that. Uh, rejected the legitimacy of the U.S. government, and instead it located itself within the global struggle against American um, imperialism. So I like to use uh, the analogy or the metaphor of the um, the 98-pound weakling on the beach uh, in the Charles Atlas ads. I don't know if you remember that, you know, where um, the, the bully was uh, calling out, hey, skinny, your ribs, so on. And then, you know, the ad was to get the bodybuilding powder and the bodybuilding exercises from Charles Atlas. Black people were the 98 pound weakling on the beach up against the muscle bully of the Charles Atlas ads. The muscle bully was the legalized system of disenfranchisement administered by the government and enforced by police systems and regulatory bodies throughout the country. Well, the Panthers stepped in and changed that. Um, the Panthers focused on black liberation, but beyond fairness and equality, the Panthers framed the black community as a colony against a colony within the United States. And it continually referred to the police as an occupying army. Okay? So Huey and Bobby had met for the first time in 1962 at a rally that opposed the United States blockade of Cuba. And it was held at what was then called Oakland City College. Uh, and it was on Grove Street, which is now Martin Luther King. And that's where I first met them. I uh, started attending um, o Oakland City College, which later became Merritt College. So I started attending it when I was 16 years old, which is not unusual for kids in California. Um, we either um, uh, finish our, our GE requirements early, we finished everything, we're tired of high school, we've been promoted up, that was my, my reason. I was actually, had just graduated at 16. So we go to the community college and Evel Younger, who became the attorney general in, um, in Ronald Reagan's administration, 
called Oakland City College, which became Merritt, he called it a hotbed of radicalism, which indeed it was. Uh, there were just uh, demonstrations and radical groups outside on Grove Street, M MLK now, on Grove Street every day. And, uh, and we'd go out there. I became a radical by osmosis. I did not know that I was absorbing these, uh, these tenants. Um, I just thought it was interesting. And I just wondered, are they gonna, are they gonna faint from heat prostration basically? However, um, I re-encountered Huey and Bobby when I transferred to San Francisco State. I knew them, I knew their work. I had reported on them for the school newspaper at Oakland City College, but it wasn't until I transferred to San Francisco State that I encountered them again. I had grown up a bit. My roommates and I went to um, a recruitment meeting. Huey and Bobby came to the colleges and they came to San Francisco State in the same manner that IBM and Clorox came to the schools. So they came, they got a room, they had sign-up sheets in the back of the room, they had a spiel that they delivered. It was, it was incredible. And my roommates uh, all decided to join the Black Panther Party that day, four, four of them. I, however, knew Huey and Bobby from uh, Oakland City College, and I said, you know, they're not playing hopscotch. This is, this is not a joke. I knew about the extent of what they were doing. But, but it was a, another long, hot summer in the United States with um, urban riots throughout. And by August, I had joined my roommates. So all of us, um, there were five of us, and they called us the Sisters with Skills. We were the first um, young people from San Francisco State to join the Black Panther Party. And most of us kept our registration current, but that quickly became our focus in life. And the, apart the, uh, the large flat that we lived in, which was a nine room flat, um, became a safe house uh, for the United States. <laughs> Somebody said, yes, as sisters with skills, yes. <laughs> and we recall that because we each did something very specific. I worked on the paper with Eldridge and Kathleen. Evelyn Proctor was the party treasurer. Joanne Mitchell um, became the um, um, officer. She was um, she, CO, she was a commanding officer. They used to call it officer of the day. Um, she was a tough, tough woman. Um, uh, my friend Janice Garrett became Bobby Seale's secretary slash, slash scheduler, and Betty, Car Betty Carter, the late Betty Carter, ran the office. So we were in it, uh, and we stayed in it for varying degrees, probably between two, three, and four years. A um, couple of us were kicked out. I wasn't ever kicked out. Instead, I became part of the Black Panther Party on campus. And I just want to uh, answer the question in advance, well, what was the continuing legacy of the Black Panther Party? Those of us who had left campus or um, absented ourselves from campus came back after uh, being active in the party for two years, including many of them, uh, many brothers were uh, there the night of the of the shootout with Eldridge and Bobby, little Bobby. Um, we came back to the campus and we came back armed, both literally and figuratively. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, so um, what happened when we came back? Um, George Mason M M Murray, whose name used to be recited like he was Osama bin Laden um, by the conservative talk show host uh, was an instructor at, uh, at uh, San Francisco State, very brilliant guy, went on and got his PhD at Stanford. Um, but at that time he was minister of information in the party 
and um, the president of the college, I can't remember if Somerville was the president then or if Hayakawa was the president, but the president of the college fired him uh, because for his radical rhetoric, rhetoric. And his rhetoric was indeed, indeed quite, ra quite radical. So um, the Black Student Union then, um, many of whom had used the student money to help purchase guns for the Black Panther Party. This is something that is not widely known, but the FBI knew all about it. It's all in the green books, what are called the green books. But um, the, um, the Black Student Union then initiated a strike and it was going to be a one day strike. It's gonna be a very short thing, short term thing. Then the list of um, demands got longer and um, we realized it was going to be a longer, a longer thing. So two things happened. One, I had been the editor in chief of the Black Panther paper um, right after the shootout with Little Bobby and Eldridge. We were all at um, Mosswood Park and Huey read um, Huey's voice was on a tape recorder and we were meeting in Mosswood Park because uh, that was a zone where presumably the FBI could not tape us. And among many other things, uh, Huey reorganized the party because so many people were in jail or in prison and he appointed me editor in chief, which, you know, shocked me and shocked my boyfriend at the time who became uh, my husband and some of you who are involved with labor know my ex-husband and his name is, I, he introduces himself as the real Clarence Thomas. So he was, he's an international labor leader and he um, led the ILWU as its secretary treasurer for many years. Okay, so we went back to the campus then um, after having worked in the Black Panther Party, attended political education classes, absorbed our ideology, and we went back and we organized this strike. It turned out to be a four and a half month strike that changed the face of American education. The strike at San Francisco State, okay? 400, um, uh, it, 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 um, it created a domino effect throughout the United States and France and Germany of students, student activism, students changing the curriculum. Um, so that was one of, that was part of the legacy and the influence of the Black Panther Party. So I wanted to just say that these things that the Black Panther Party did, um, they were, these tactics were picked up on by other radical groups, other activists, including the Young Lords, SNCC, of course, which had been active before, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the American Indian Movement, and the Chicano Workers Movement. All of these were representing groups that were uh, vulnerable, marginalized, and living under constant threat. Look at those three <laughs> descriptions, they're still going on today. You know, so many of these groups uh, uh, incorporated the works of the Black Panther Party members into their social members, social movements. They used the rhetoric of the Black Panthers. They used the organization as a model. They studied the party's political philosophy with many books. It's use of uniforms and its 10-point program. They published their own newspapers using graphics, using editorial cartoons. Um, they interacted with and impacted, as the party did, the anti-Vietnam War movement. They left, a, and the party left a visual legacy that we now see young artists have responded to and are studying vigorously, even using its rhetoric in rap music. And we, of course, we remember Beyonce giving the beautiful performance at the Super Bowl. So, um, so I wanted to just talk very briefly about the Panther graphics. And most of us are familiar with, with them um, 
created by Emory Douglas primarily, and also by Tarika Lewis, who was called Matalaba at the time. Some of her work is gonna be signed Matalaba. She's now known as Tarika Lewis um, and, and other artists. They graphically introduce the public to this new vision of black politics. I have my timer on, is it working? Yeah, I got six minutes, okay. <laughs> Wanna make sure, okay. So, so um, this was very important, this timer, I mean timer, this, um, this idea of graphics, because they made visual all the demands of the civil rights movement, um, all the demands of the black power movement, of the NAACP, the Urban League, even the Nation of Islam, you know? Um, they made all of this graphic. Um, and, and it was uh, disturbing to many people. Uh, they called out not only uh, police, but they called out the black middle class also and call them bootlickers. Of course, we know they call the, the police pigs. So that was a lasting legacy. And for hundreds of years, black people have been um, called um, apes, baboons, coons, other terms donating, uh, uh, um, uh, denoting animals and um, and had been made fun of for their um, their physical characteristics uh, and um, differences, and of course the color of our skin. Uh, so Jean-Paul Sartre says that he said that one of the necessary things for people who are oppressed to do is to learn the language of the master and use it against the master to break, tear down his house. So, so when the Panthers came up with the term pigs for police to indicate um, 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 to indicate vicious behavior, brutal oppression, um, insatiable lust for um, damaging, hurting uh, others of color. Um, it was a perfect expression because it really did not attack um, the physicalness of, um, of any policeman. Policemen obviously don't look like, um, they don't look like pigs. Um, um, they don't, they haven't descended from pigs. Uh, uh, however, it provided a ready metaphor, instant metaphor that people could understand. And so I think that um, the Black Panther's legacy is not the armed, um, the arm, the taking up of arms. Um, I think it's um, finding words to, uh, to express oppression, uh, finding images to express oppression. And when it did that, it motivated many, many, many other groups, many, many other people to see um, the oppression that was um, uh, in the United States. So I, I, I speak often and people say, um, oh, we need the Black Panthers again now. And I said, no, 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 we're all Panthers now. We all see it because of the, of the, um, of the um, of cell cell phones and other um, uh, means of uh, transmission, it's in our face. It's not hidden anymore. The Black Panthers were talking about a phenomenon that people didn't recognize was nationwide and even worldwide. It, it however, uh, our seeing that the Black Panther Party um, um, had sixty eight chapters throughout cities in the United States uh, is a convincing argument that people understood at that point that this oppression was systemic and that we needed a system of, um, of um, an active, active revolt 
um, in order to, um, to answer to it, to conquer it. So we still haven't conquered it, but we, we made a lot of progress. We were the vanguard party. We were the vanguard party. And, uh, we ha and we also, some people would say, we were the canary in the coal mine. We, we let people know, listen, there's, the police have too much power in this country and um, in this system, and it should, should not be so. So my, my timer just went off. I've done 20 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. So um, good to see um, all of you. And uh, listen to Judy, who it's been a real pleasure to get to know over the last several years. I wasn't in Oakland in um, 1968, but I was back east in college. And um, when I was in New Haven, um, Bobby Seale was on trial for his life. Um, and so I got involved in the periphery of that because they asked students to go knock on doors and ask people if, about the presumption of innocence. Um, because they were concerned that they wouldn't seat a, a fair jury. Now, the Bobby Seale trial um, ended um, favorably for him. Uh, it was uh, 10 to 2 for acquittal, um, and Erica Huggins, who was his co-defendant, but it came after the Huey Newton trial. And so what I wanted to focus on is how much of an impact the trial of Huey Newton had um, historically, both for Oakland and for the country. And... Um, how that came about. Um, first of all, um, as Judy was saying, there are, was a history of uh, frustration. Um, and it went back to World War II when there had been a huge influx of great migration because of, because of the war. They needed bodies. They needed people working in the factories for the war. And so they were encouraged by FDR and Henry Kaiser to come to the Bay Area from the South. But the assumption among some of the leadership, uh, white leadership in the Bay Area was when the war was over, they'd go back home. Well, that wasn't their plan. They planned to stay. And what happened was there was insufficient um, housing. There weren't enough jobs after the war. Uh, they hadn't planned to have enough schools. Um, and the police um, were white male and were viewed as an occupying army by the um, black residents of West Oakland and East Oakland, where most of them lived. So you had that building up for 20 years when the Panther Party um, came into existence. And what the Panthers did is they took 10 different issues that, the, that had already been there and put them into a party platform. And so that's what they focused on about wanting power to determine the destiny of the black community, to have full employment, um, various other issues that um, resonated. And uh, one of the things that they did, which was different from any other group, was that they carried guns. And Huey Newton would um, go on patrol around uh, West Oakland with a, a, a few other, there were a handful, just a handful of people who were members of the Black Panther Party at that point. And this is 1966 into early 1967. They'd follow the police around because the police would stop and arrest um, black, young black men. And there were new um, rules issued by the U.S. Supreme Court about how you handle that. So it's called the Miranda rights. We grew up thinking that they always existed. Well, they didn't until the mid 60s. And so Huey took um, a law class at night. He actually took it from Ed Meese, who became the Attorney General of the United States when Reagan became president. And he was a really good student. And he studied California gun law and he would bring his criminal law book with him. And when the police stopped someone, he would read that person, that person's rights. Um, and there was a lot of tension because he was guarded by his own, by the Panthers with guns. The police um, got a sponsor to change the law in, in the spring of 67, because up until then, you could carry, open carry in California, and it was changed. It became the most restrictive state in the country, and it was nicknamed the Black Panther Bill. Uh, and that, the, so that was what prompted it. Well, everybody knew that there might be a confrontation one day between the police and Huey and other Panthers. And what happened in October of 1968 um, early morning, what, I'm sorry, not October 67, um, was a uh, confrontation where uh, 
two police officers stopped Huey Newton and a, and a friend of his in his car uh, for no apparent reason other than they had a license plate that uh, matched a list of known Black Panthers. Um, and a confrontation occurred. They were shot, there were shots fired. Uh, the, one of the policemen was killed, the other one was wounded, and Huey Newton was, was severely wounded and almost died. That's what um, prompted um, the hospitalization. I don't know if you can see on my book cover, but there's a picture of a policeman with Huey on the gurney uh, headed to an operation that was going to save his life. Um, and th there was a photo taken by a San Francisco examiner uh, photographer. And the Panthers used that photo in their brochures of trying to stir up community support for Huey because here he was shackled to that gurney on his way into surgery um, in a very painful position with a stomach wound. Uh, and they did not expect him to get a fair trial. It was assumed by everyone who supported the Panthers that he was going to get the death penalty because a, a white policeman had died and no one had ever heard of a black man, any black man in America, um, who was accused of killing a white policeman getting anything but the death penalty. So the, the focus of this trial um, became uh, tr attacking the uh, historic system of having 12 white men on the jury. The Constitution says you have a right to a jury of your peers, but the peers had always been white men and most of the defendants were minorities. And this had been happening for a very, very long time. Uh, so the question was, how do you challenge that? Well, they got two brilliant radical lawyers um, to challenge that in the courthouse. And outside the courthouse, the Panthers demonstrated in, uh, in support of Huey uh, and got international attention to this trial. So what, it, what interested me in it in the first place, because I wasn't here, was number one, I had experience with the Bobby Seale trial. And number two, I was on the board of California Women Lawyers, and they give out an award every year in the name of Faye Stender, who became, who was one of the attorneys who represented Huey Newton, and thought this was one of the most significant cases in uh, the 20th century, and I wanted to find out why. So I did the research on it and realized that up until that time, uh, defense lawyers picking a jury would just take the first 12 people who didn't have two heads. Uh, they didn't realize that it was okay to uh, quiz jurors very um, strenuously uh, about whether they had uh, what we now call implicit bias. It wasn't done. Uh, but Charles Gary was different, and that was something he did do. Uh, so he became very famous for the way he handled the uh, seating of that jury. And they wound up with uh, seven women, um, five men, and only two of those men were white. This was unheard of, okay, and in a, especially in a death penalty case. And only one of those um, jurors was black. He was a banker from San Francisco. Well, the Panthers didn't trust him. The police didn't particularly trust him. But um, th the prosecutor, Lowell Jensen, was uh, wanted to have at least one black on the jury because he could see everyone demonstrating outside every day, revolution has come, time to pick up the gun. It was so tense following the assassination of Martin Luther King that uh, Jensen wanted community buy-in for the result of this trial. He didn't want them to think that they would pick a jury that was going to um, have their thumb on the scale from the outset. So that was part of his thinking. The judge felt the same way. So they had that combination in addition to the lawyers. And they wound up with uh, the foreman, who's also on the cover of my book, um, David Harper, who was a, an amazing man, he taught, um, he taught business organization at night at, 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 in the, the Peralta College system. Um, and he had served on juries in the past and he knew his way around a jury. And what he did was he played cards with the women during the trial so they'd trust him. And at the end of the trial is when you pick the foreman. And they picked the, him as foreman within five minutes. Well, he thought maybe some of the people who voted were just looking for a scapegoat. Um, but they did trust him um, to handle this. And there was one uh, older white man on the jury who um, David Harper thought would be the logical choice at the beginning. Um, but I guess he didn't really want the job. In any event, um, when this jury was out, you have 
uh, a two month trial, when the jury was deliberating, you, um, Jensen said that you could have heard a pin drop in the entire city, that there was no crime to speak of. People were very nervous because Eldridge Cleaver, who was the spokesman for the Panthers, was, was out there in the streets saying, we're going to have guerrilla warfare across the country if he dies. So there was that um, egging on going on by uh, him. And in Chicago, at the same time as the last week of the Newton trial, was the Democratic Convention, which maybe some of you know, uh, erupted in riots caused by the police outside of the convention center. And there were images on TV of the police bashing heads, not only of demonstrators, but of uh, bystanders and reporters. So it was a very heavy setting. And there had just been two assassinations earlier in the year. So there was a lot of tension surrounding this trial. And I just wanted to read to you a little bit of what it was like in that jury room. Uh, so, uh, they were in there for four days. As the third day of deliberations wore on, the jurors' tempers started to fray. On Sunday, when reasoned discussion had all but evaporated, Harper threatened to send a note to, the, to Judge Friedman asking for a reminder that they were required to be dispassionate in their deliberations. Some of the other jurors took offense. Harper was taken aback. So he didn't send the note, but he was at, now feeling at his wit's end. So they said, let's have a recess, a break. And he said, I can resign as foreman. We don't want you to resign. I want you to understand that knowing what happened in that jury room is very, very rare. There was a book written a year after this trial where Harper was interviewed. And so we got that. Plus, we interviewed him for our film project. So because he's in his 80s now and he's still available. So you, you're getting this insight. Around five o'clock, I thought I wasn't going to be able to pull it off because he wanted a unanimous jury. Uh, he wanted justice to be perceived to be done. He wanted them all to agree. And I went into the restroom and felt like I was going to throw up. So I straightened up and came back out as poker as I've always been and as friendly as I've always been and said, we've got to finish this job. We cannot go to mistrial. We've got to finish this. So I buckled back down and went through this whole thing, trying to come up with some kind of agreement in applying a law that would justify the verdict. And I'm, uh, after that experience, they all agreed at, the, at 10 o'clock that night on a, a verdict of voluntary manslaughter, which attributed fault to both sides after reviewing all the evidence. Who had, did Huey have a gun? No, Huey didn't have a gun. Uh, did the officer instigate it? Yes, the officer instigated it. Um, but Huey overreacted. Okay, so, he, so he's, it's not one where he, he can be acquitted. And so they went through all that, and that's how they got there. And the youngest member of the uh, male member of the jury was a man named Tom Hoffman, who's now in his 70s, but was only 25 back then. And he said that he served on a number of juries over his lifetime after that, but this was the first. And he strongly believes in the importance of that service. But he said that what they did, um, they analyzed every question, came to a conclusion, and we just eliminated anything people might have had preconceived uh, thoughts about, and it was just the process of law. And they came back into the courtroom, and their verdict was read, and it shocked everyone. Nobody believed that was going to be the result. Now, Charles Gary secretly caught, thought it was a victory, a great victory, um, but he, called, he told the press it was a chicken shit verdict. Um, I, there was disappointment on the prosecution side, but acceptance. Um, and what was most interesting to David Harper was that the community, white community and black community, accepted the verdict as the jury's effort to do justice, and there was peace. There were no riots. The only violence that occurred after that jury verdict was, was the next night, um, two policemen got drunk, and they... Um, went to the Panther headquarters in the middle of the night and they shot it up. They shot up the window. No one was there, but they shot up the, the front window of Panther headquarters and they were immediately suspended and then fired by the, the, the chief of police because he didn't want the police starting the riots that they had just near, they just avoided. Uh, so I think that Judy was there um, in that building maybe earlier in the day. I don't know, but she can comment on that. But in any event, 
um, there was no violence. And what happened um, as a result of that trial and its outcome is a book was written the following year called Minimizing Racism in Jury Trials, the voir dire in the Huey Newton case. And what, they, what was done by Ann Ginger, who is a civil rights lawyer who uh, worked in Berkeley, was to take what um, the questions that Charles Gary asked the potential jurors, to take Faye Stender's trial um, work, um, she wrote uh, uh, research and wrote a lot of motions, and put it together uh, to show how it could be done elsewhere. And that book became the Bible for criminal defense lawyers nationwide. So when we look back to why we have diverse juries today, we have them in large part because of this one case. So that's the hugest legacy um, that I see uh, from this trial, but it's not the only one. Um, after that, um, Bobby Seale ran for mayor in 1973 um, of Oakland. And um, that started a wave of black candidates. Um, he was part of that first wave of black candidates across country. The Pan he didn't win, but the Panthers played a big part in electing Lionel Wilson in 1977 uh, as the first black mayor of Oakland and only the second African-American mayor uh, of a major city on the West Coast. And he served three terms. Um, and he was very proud of the fact that he was the very first mayor in 60 years to win without the endorsement of the conservative Oakland Tribune, uh, which was then uh, known all the way up until then as the power in the Oakland Tribune Tower. Uh, but they had hand-selected mayors for more than half a century. Well, the New York Times said that Lionel Wilson ushered in a new era of city politics um, that was radical um, and in terms of its change in both racially, culturally, politically, and economic. It was a revolution in those um, areas. Um, so the other, th uh, another a legacy of the Panthers is the diversification of police departments, um, because what was going on was this us-them um, street warfare, essentially, when the police came in to enforce the laws, and they and they were much better protected if they were diverse than if they were all white. So there was an incentive at that point to diversify. Uh, one of the other achievements of the Panthers was they changed the laws in, in uh, they helped change the laws in, in Oakland to elect the city council district by district except for one at large member as opposed to citywide. Electing them citywide meant you you never almost never got a, a minority candidate to succeed. Mayor Jean Kwan, who became the first Asian mayor of Oakland, said she stood on the shoulders of the Panthers because that's how she got on the city council in the first place was their success. And in 2013, she appointed as city administrator a man named Fred Blackwell, who had attended the Black Panther Community School as a child. And Jean Kwan was interviewed for our film. She said, it's just amazing that in a generation, uh, Fred Blackwell goes from a child of protesters against pr police brutality to the person running the city and hiring the police chief. So that was another major change. And um, in addition to that, they were very instrumental in the uh, creation of the first police review board in Oakland, which is only uh, one of the, um, I think, the second or third in, in the country. Um, Lionel Wilson instituted that to allow for community review of the police. And that has evolved now to the police commission, which we have in Oakland, which has the most power of any um, police review uh, body in the country. They exercised that not last year in firing the police chief. Generally, that's the uh, prerogative of the mayor. Uh, so you see all these different uh, results. Uh, one of the things I thought was interesting was when we interviewed a former uh, police chief in Oakland um, for the film, he said he wished they had body cams back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Because if they had them, then we'd actually know a lot more about what happened in that confrontation uh, between Huey and the two policemen. So. Uh, what I wanted to end with is just talking about the film project be, uh, because it, what we're focused on is that we have a broken justice system and a lot of it is because we have mostly white male 
prosecutors, mostly white male judges across country, not in Alameda County. We're very diverse. We're diverse in our uh, prosecutor's office, in the public defender's office, and on the bench. In fact, one of our people we interviewed was Nancy O'Malley, the first woman DA, and she gave me my favorite quote from the film project. She said, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Uh, but what we're trying to do is to show that other parts of the justice system could benefit from what happened with diversification of the jury. There would be more community buy-in nationwide um, from various parts of the community uh, among minorities and women if they were saw themselves more as part of the justice system. So I think I've used all my time. Thank you, Lisa. That was wonderful. Really appreciate that. Uh, with that, there are a lot of questions that came through the chat box, so I will actually turn it over to Will Cliver, and he will moderate some of those questions. Uh, if you want to amend your question in any way, feel free, um, and we'll just kind of open up the dialogue after this. Yeah, so there was a lot of comments, uh, a lot of compliments. Uh, a question for Judy. Uh, did you write a semi-autobiographical historical novel about your time editing the Panther Paper? Yes, uh, it's called Virgin Soul, and uh, I wrote it. It came out from Viking in 2013, and the paperback edition came out in 2017. So it's widely available. You can get it at bookstores. But it's very funny. Somebody, um, I was at an event, and somebody said they were at Emery's house, and they said, oh, just turn to page 200. That's when the Panther stuff starts. Before that, it's girly stuff. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's about a, the female foot soldier mm -hmm. in the movement at that time. So it, it's set between 64 and 68. Okay, thank you. Speaking of which, uh, what was your reaction when you heard the verdict of the Newton trial? You know, I saw that question on the chat and I could not remember. I'm going to tell you something that that period was so full that there was something death defying and exciting happening every single day. So that period was about when Eldridge was um, was making the decision or was about to go into exile. Um, many Panthers were um, hijacking the planes to Cuba, including Bill Brent. Um, Bobby Seale and uh, uh, Lee said he was involved with the Chicago 7 and the trial, and, and then that trial started up there with Bobby protesting, even though he was, um, he, he was, yeah, when it said Eldridge went into exile in November. Yeah, all of this was all going on. And actually, um, I, I had gotten married to Clarence on um, June 23rd, 1968. So basically our honeymoon was the Free Huey trial and the Free Huey protest, you know? So, and, and our son was born in August the following year. So conception was also happening somewhere around that time. We were all um, working day, day, day in, day out. Um, we, we saw that as a victory of sorts, but we just had to keep working, keep working, keep working. Because of course, because of the Free Huey movement, our, that's when the Panther Party expanded nationwide and internationally. So I really don't remember, but I'll tell you who has an even better memory than I have is Clarence. So his nickname is Buzz. So I'll ask Buzz about it and get back to you with an answer, Dan. <laughs> He, he remembers things that I don't remember. I remember a lot of things, but my, my memories generally have to be jogged by um, some, some, some historical event that was happening at that moment. And then I'll remember, oh yeah, I was at my dad's house and this, you know, so forth. So it impacted us, but we were revolutionaries. We were working on things day by day, day by day. Excellent. And the last question I have for you is actually mine. Uh, you mentioned because of the ubiquity of recording and cell phones and video, uh, I think I'm quoting you correctly, you say we're all Panthers. Is there anything we can do proactively other than, say, recording something if we see something uh, that you would take from your history to advise us today? Um, so, so I'm to answer that. <laughs> um, I like the things that you 
you had um, outlined that the Rotary is doing right now. You know, no matter what we do, um, we're always going to run into this, these huge inequities. So when you, when you fight, when you go out and volunteer, you know, f to help seniors um, get their food or to, you, you know, to help children read in a literacy project, you're, you're fighting there. You're fighting. One thing you're going to fight, um, you're going to fight administrative um, inefficiency and you're going to fight bureaucracy, you know, because we have all these levels of um, what my friend calls comfort corrupt in this society. People get very, very comfortable. They get a position and they're, they're comfortable in it. And so they don't want to move and they don't want to really make, make that work um, the way it should for quote, the people. So wherever you are, you're going to fight. If you care about people and you care about um, the old classic um, 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 ideals, justice, fairness, equality, compassion, you know, all those things. The minute you, you try to do something, you really have, in effect, picked up arms. You haven't picked up AK-47s, but you got to do something, and you're going to do it once you involve yourself in trying to help other people. So I think whether it doesn't matter to me what you try to do, it's just don't live in a bubble and just live by yourself and just live for your own creature comfort. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, going to you, Lise, uh, we have a question um, about Elaine Brown wrote a, how damaged Huey was by his time uh, in the, quote, soul breaker, solitary confinement uh, unit in the courthouse. Can you speak about the soul breaker? Um, okay. Um, my recollection was that was at Santa Rita because um, he'd been in jail for um, a couple of years beforehand. Uh, that wasn't from his time at Alameda. When he, pre-trial in Alameda, uh, he actually had a lot of visitors. He had uh, one lawyer from uh, Charles Gary staff who was there frequently, he had a number of reporters come and visit him. He was alone. He liked being actually um, in a single cell. But I don't think that happened at Alameda County Courthouse. Mm -hmm. And was that standard at the time to keep people in solitary, or was that just because he was black? Well, um, I, no, it wasn't standard, um, but he was, um, they wanted to keep him separate from the, um, what, who they called the Oakland Seven. The Oakland Seven were a number of anti-war demonstrators, leaders of the anti-war effort, who were arrested in October of 67, just two weeks before Huey was arrested. And so there were a lot of supporters for, the, for Huey who came from Berkeley in the anti-war movement, and they wanted to keep him separate from those other defendants. Interesting. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, we have a follow-up question. But uh, he was affected by that soul breaker, solitary confinement. That was, I, I believe it was Santa Rita, though. Gotcha. Cool. Thank you. A uh, follow-up question for you, Judy. Uh, who was it you said coined comfort corrupt? I don't know. I first heard my, um, my friend's um, daughter, Erica, what's er Erica Gomes, used that, you know, and I've used it since then. So I don't know if Erica made it up herself. But her contention is that we as Americans are comfort corrupt, and I definitely believe that. Um, and I think that our, our reaction this past weekend to the COVID restrictions and to ignoring them shows that we just can't do without having fun and going and doing our own thing. And it's, it may be to our detriment. We'll, we'll find out in two weeks and two days right? It takes that long for it, for it to surface and yeah. hit the statistical, you know, data. Excellent. One thing I wanted to mention about how he was treated, in, uh, how he was treated in the trial was different than a lot of other black defendants at the time, which is that he was not brought in in jail clothing. Uh, he was given the opportunity that his uh, lawyers asked for to dress up. His brother brought him uh, good-looking outfits, uh, turtlenecks and um, slacks, um, so that he looked very presentable at trial, which was a big plus. 
And you had talked about the jury selection process and I, anybody who's familiar with it, I don't think would say it's perfect today, uh, though it was improved by the situation you described. How would you advise fixing it to be better today? The jury system? Well, we should pay jurors. I think they get, uh, with some places, $5 a day. It's really hard to get a jury that has any representation from people who are poor, um, people who are, uh, have a small business. I mean, you see what's happening with the virus. Um, when you're out for any length of time and you don't have a lot of employees who can cover for you. Um, so when you have a long trial, if you have a trial like the Newton trial, two month trial, or even a two week trial, you're going to get people who are employees of very large companies or government employees or whatever, who are the only ones basically who are going to say it won't be a hardship. Right. That makes sense. Okay. That was the last question I had. If anybody else has a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. I just asked, uh, Juanita, or I mean, sorry, Judy, about um, the international, just because I'm into international stuff. And she said she rattled off like six or seven countries, Australia, Germany, France, Philippines, London, and the Netherlands. I was just wondering if, did they make inroads and in progress um, for um, people of African American heritage in their countries and in, in these various places, or was it really small fringy movements or I, I don't know I've never heard about it um I think they their focus wasn't on making um changes for us for African Americans or African Americans in their country they were having problems in their own countries and so um in one country I forget they they named themselves the Yellow Panthers you know, it's, it's an Asian country. I can't remember which one. So they were fighting for um, for the disenfranchised in their own countries. Um, and and right. a couple of them we didn't even know about or hadn't had contact with until the 50th anniversary. And then when it was held at the Oakland Museum a few years ago. And representatives from all over the world came there, not just all over the United States. And I remember being surprised with the, some other pan Panthers or former Panthers at seeing people from the Philippines there. I just wanted to add on to what uh, Judy was just saying about the, what that huge gathering at the Oakland Museum. It wasn't just that international conference. There was this 50th anniversary um, special exhibit at the Oakland Museum. It had the largest attendance of any they ever um, put on. Uh, and uh, during that same time period, a portion of Defremery Park where the Panthers used to gather uh, was dedicated to Bobby Hutton. Uh, so it's called Bobby Hutton Grove and that's still there. And someone asked ahead of time, where can you go around Oakland to see some of the uh, sites where the Panthers were? Well, there's a list I provided, uh, I hope uh, Dan can put it up there for you. Uh, of uh, different sites, but one of them is the, is the Oakland Museum itself, which has a replica, it's not the original, but it's a replica of the Wicker Throne that was, uh, Huey was always pictured in, in the Black Panther newspaper. And it's, it's the full size and you can sit in it and have your picture taken. Uh, and it's in one of the um, sections of the museum. And actually one of the things I wanted to mention is that the courthouse is right there. Um, the kitty corner across from the museum. And what's interesting is that the museum was under construction at the time of Huey Newton's trial. And so the garage uh, wasn't quite finished, but it had a roof. It was filled with police and they were ready at the end of that trial to go in and bash heads and it never happened. Excellent, there's another the question. Firmary, the Firmary Park is also, you know, the scene um, of many, um, and, and it's, been unofficially renamed Little Bobby Hutton Park, but it was a gathering of um, a very effective gathering place um, during the, the party uh, party's early years. And um, actually, you know, I was a young person then. Um, the party really had a small number of members, but it had a huge number of fellow travelers. So any uh, Saturday or Sunday when there was a gathering, a rally protest at Defermery, there would be thousands of people there. And it was really, it was really like a very hip spot 
you know, very hip way to to spend your time. And it's just kind of interesting now, you know, to, to look back on it and for me to see that. Yes. I think we have time for one last question. Uh, Peter Henry. Uh, Lisa, uh, this is for you. What needs to happen for the film to come out? For the film, I was just about to say, we are, um, I just received from our director, Andy Abrams Wilson, who uh, has his own film company in Marin, uh, the rough cut. And what we need to do with a rough cut is get the funding to um, fine tune it, to put in music, to get the rights to have some of the um, archival photos and video um, included in the film and various other aspects. Uh, so we're going to, we've been invited to come back to places like HBO um, to uh, visit them again when we had a rough cut. So here we are about to do that. Uh, so it's going to take us a little while, but I understand that with the coronavirus, one of the side effects is that people are really hungry for content on um, PBS and HBO and Netflix because as so many people are staying at home and have exhausted a lot of what they have uh, available to see. So we're hoping that helps us uh, get the film out. If you're interested, uh, let me tell you the website, www.americanjusticeontrial.com. And uh, you can uh, let us know uh, if you're interested in the newsletter and finding out, you know, when and how we get this thing launched. Uh, thank you again, Judy, Lisa. It was a wonderful conversation. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and in our appreciation, uh, Rotary has a long-standing uh, mission uh, across the world, and that's the eradication of polio. Uh, and so to, uh, to give our appreciation to both of you, we'll be making a donation in both your names uh, to the Polio Plus Foundation. Uh, we're this close to eradicating polio and we're gonna get the rest of the way soon.